To wrap up chapter 8, pages 157 to 166 in rhetorical grammar, we're talking about two topics, dependent clauses and elliptical adverbials. We've already seen the dependent clause in chapter 4. A dependent clause makes use of a subordinating conjunction, so not a fanboy's word, those are coordinating conjunctions, plus a complete sentence. Here are some common subordinating conjunctions. There are some prepositions on this list, like after, before, if, but there's a difference between saying after 9 p.m., which is a prepositional phrase, an adverbial that tells me when, versus after I get up at 9 p.m. That's a dependent clause because I get up at 9 p.m. is a complete sentence with a subject and a predicate and can stand on its own. Dependent clauses can carry a lot of important information. So why should you use a dependent clause rather than a prepositional phrase, an adverbial noun phrase, an infinitive verb phrase, as your go-to adverbial? I decided to look at the first lines in famous poems and novels. Jane Austen in Pride and Prejudice writes, it is a truth universally acknowledged. And then we get our dependent clause, starting with the subordinating conjunction that, that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. J.K. Rowling, in the first book in the Harry Potter series, also relies on a that clause. Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four, Privet Drive, were proud to say that they were perfectly normal. Thank you very much. Both of these sentences could stand on their own without the that clause. It is a truth universally acknowledged. Mr. and Mrs. Dursley were proud to say. But those sentences sort of leave you hanging, don't they? It is a truth universally acknowledged. Well, what truth? Hello? They were proud to say, what? <laughs> You're going to hold out on us? You're not going to tell us what these people said? So in the first, we have a that clause that gives us quite a bit of information. A rich bachelor must want to get married. The beginning of the sentence really just sets us up for this punchline. In our second example, while it's very nice to know where these people live, the best part is the end. It tells us so much about these characters. They were perfectly normal. Thank you very much. As our book says on page 157, the great thing about a dependent clause is that it, quote, has the information bearing quality of a complete sentence without standing outside a semicolon, a colon, or a period. Beautiful examples of the known new contract. Here's a modern translation of the first 12 lines of the general prologue to the Canterbury Tales. So this is jumping far back in British literary history to Geoffrey Chaucer and medieval English. Where are their dependent clauses? Struggle through it. Look for your subordinating conjunctions. The first 11 lines are dependent clauses. Yep. The independent clause is the last line. Then do folk long to go on pilgrimage. Everything else is part of one of two when subordinate clauses. When April with his showers sweet with fruit, the draught of March has pierced unto the root, and bathed each vein with a liquor that has power to generate therein and sire the flower. And notice we've got a semicolon there. This is all a dependent clause. It cannot stand on its own unless we take the when off. Then it's a complete sentence. April has pierced unto the root. Second dependent clause, 
when Zephyr also has, with his sweet breath, quickened again in every Holton Heath, the tender shoots and buds, and the young sun into the ram, one half his course is run, and many little birds make melody that sleep through all the night with open eye, so nature pricks them on to ramp and rage. All subordinate clause. If I take off the when, it's a complete sentence. A long sentence with lots of compounding and prepositional phrases, but a complete sentence nonetheless. What's the purpose of these 11 lines? Apparently, Chaucer really wants to establish when folk do long to go on pilgrimage. When do they long to go on pilgrimage? Spring. April. Everything is sweet, flowering, tender shoots and buds, suns, birds, new life, rebirth. What better time to go on a religious journey, to renew your faith? Do you think that these subordinate clauses overwhelm the main clause? Do they build up suspense? Do we lose sight of the bottom line? Folk go on pilgrimage. Think about it, because I'll ask you in class. One final example. Fast forward, fast forward to the 20th century. This comes from the first paragraph of The Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger, another popular and controversial work of young adult literature. Where do you see dependent clauses? Look for your subordinating conjunctions. Where Chaucer gives us when clauses, Salinger gives us if clauses. And if is one of those subordinating conjunctions that our book describes as contingency. If you really want to hear about it, the first thing you'll probably want to know is where I was born and what my lousy childhood was like and how my parents were occupied and all before they had me and all that David Copperfield kind of crap. But I don't feel like going into it if you want to know the truth. In the first place, that stuff bores me. And in the second place, my parents would have two hemorrhages apiece if I told anything pretty personal about them. Meta discourse <laughs> all over the place with this first person, and then we get in the first place, in the second place. But we also have dependent clauses. If you really want to hear about it, if you want to know the truth, if I told anything pretty personal about them. These subordinate clauses are really drawing the reader in, implying you really want to hear about it. You want to know the truth. Maybe I will tell you something personal about my parents. You can use a dependent clause at the beginning of the sentence, if you really want to hear about it, or you can end the sentence with one, if you want to know the truth. Cole and Gray, the editors of our textbook, say that adverbial clauses are certainly common structures in our language. We use them automatically and often in conversation. But in writing, they are not automatic nor are they always used as effectively as they could be. So what mistakes can we make with dependent clauses? We might subordinate the wrong idea. We might take the main idea, the juicy, meaty, new information, and subordinate it at the beginning of the sentence, and then have new, known. Whoop, nope, violates our contract. We might use a confusing subordinating conjunction, one that really doesn't make sense, that fails to capture the relationship between the ideas in my dependent clause and my independent clause. Or I can coordinate two sentences when really the ideas are not equal. One should be subordinated. One should be dependent. So let's look at some examples. I've rewritten part of those first few sentences of The Catcher in the Rye. Read them out loud to yourself in your head. What do you think? It doesn't sound right, does it? You really want to hear about it before the first thing you'll probably want to know is where I was born. What the heck? This choice of subordinating conjunction leads to rhetorical confusion. 
which is bad. That's not the point of mastering grammar. I have two complete sentences. I've used a subordinating conjunction. I've done everything I'm supposed to, but my message does not get across. What subordinating conjunction would work better here? You really want to hear about it, since the first thing you'll probably want to know is where I was born? No. You really want to hear about it as long as the first thing you'll probably want to know is where I was born? As long as you really want to hear about it, the first thing you'll probably want to know is where I was born? Maybe I've also subordinated the wrong clause here. If you look back at the original, you might agree that this is the case. What if I coordinated these sentences? You really want to hear about it. And the first thing you'll probably want to know is where I was born. Well, that certainly sounds better than before, literally, before. Another example. I don't feel like going into it, and you want to know the truth. Should these two ideas be coordinated? Should I be using an and, one of my fanboy's words? These are coordinated badly. Something needs to be subordinated. I don't feel like going into it, even though you want to know the truth. I don't feel like going into it, whereas you want to know the truth. As long as I don't feel like going into it, you want to know the truth. I need to subordinate something here. And I have a lot of choices. All of those versions that you just heard put a different spin on these ideas. So you want to choose your subordinating conjunctions really carefully. What about dependent clauses in the known new contract? Just to review, the contract states that we promise our readers we will start with known information, not the new main idea. We save that for the end. Here's an example. New policy requires, requires what? That you pass practice Texas exams. Since this change in teacher education requirements, many students have changed their majors. So notice I use my dependent subordinate clause at the beginning of the sentence to reinforce that this is new policy, this is a change, and then I give my new information. As a result, many students have changed their majors. What if you flip this? New policy requires that you pass practice Texas exams. Many students have changed their majors since this change in teacher education requirements. Still makes sense, it's still grammatical, but it's not the most cohesive choice. How do you punctuate dependent clauses? If you open a sentence with a dependent clause, you typically put your comma after it right before the main clause. Although we worked hard on our project, comma, we only earned a B. What if our clause ends a sentence? This is trickier. It depends on your dependent clause. You use a comma only when the main clause doesn't make sense, doesn't have a complete meaning without the dependent clause. If your ending clause is just extra bonus, non-restrictive information, you use a comma. Your book gives some examples on page 160 that when your clause opens a sentence, the comma rule applies no matter how short that clause may be. And then you get some examples of when a dependent clause ending a sentence requires a comma, versus when it doesn't. Let's look at some additional examples. How would you punctuate these three sentences? Write yourself a little note, stick your finger to the screen, tell the person next to you, hey, I put a comma here, or no, nah, I don't think this needs a comma, do you? Come up with concrete answers, not, oh, I'll just wait for her to tell me where they go, because maybe I'm not gonna tell you in the video how to punctuate these things.
You will get the answers after you take today's quiz. So hold on in your head to where you would place the commas or keep your scratch paper handy so you can check your choices against what I tell you. Now we're going to do a little bit of practice from exercise 24 on page 159. Here are the directions. Take these sentences and make them into dependent clauses. So you want to add a subordinating conjunction. Our book has a nice list on page 157. And once you have subordinated these, they can no longer stand on their own. They need a complementary main clause complete sentence to piggyback on, to come before or after. So again, you are not adding a dependent clause to these sentences. You are making these sentences into dependent clauses. Take some time to practice this. I'll give you some nice inspirational music while you do so. Say it out loud, write it down, whatever helps you learn best, but actually do this. Here are just a few examples of what you might have done. Maybe you made the dependent clause something that would go at the beginning of the sentence, in which case I would need a comma before my main clause. When Cleo couldn't pay her phone bill last month, her service was disconnected. Cause, effect. Maybe you decided to put your dependent clause at the end of the sentence. Here's my example. We sent a check in case Cleo couldn't pay her phone bill last month. Here, I don't have a comma because my dependent clause really contributes to the meaning of the main clause. We sent a check. Why? There's more that needs to be said. This dependent clause is necessary, vital information. No comma. What about our second sentence? I decided to go with although Ben couldn't decide which SUV to buy, his wife Jessica was set on a Ferrari. Can you see how this could lead to a fantastic story? Cherry red and super sleek, the car appealed to all of her design sensibilities. She didn't care that they had 10 children. She wanted to feel the wind in her hair. My second example would set up a very different story. I have no new car today since Ben couldn't decide which SUV to buy. Now my story, because of the known new contract, is going to be about Ben's indecisive nature. He looked at this, he looked at that, that was too expensive, on and on and on, until, you know, in conclusion, we left the dealer with no car, and I walked to work today. You probably came up with some pretty fantastic examples of your own. You may be asked to share your fantastic examples on the quiz for today's class. So if you need to pause and rewind and actually do this activity, now would be the time to do so. At the bottom of 161 in our book, there's a heading that says the because clause myth. When you write dependent clauses, you often make them into sentence fragments because there is so much information there, because if you just took off that pesky little subordinating conjunction, it would be a complete sentence. Perhaps because we use because clauses in speech as complete thoughts and complete sentences, complete answers to questions. Why should I? Because I said so. We sometimes translate that into our writing as well. You can start a sentence with because, you're going to need because, blah, 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 comma, actual main point. Why not? Because I said so, you may not have the keys to the car. That's a complete sentence. It's a complex sentence with a dependent and an independent clause. Another note, if your because clause is new information, it should end your sentence. 
Don't put all your good, fantastic, shocking information at the beginning of the sentence with a because clause. Put it at the end. Um, how many of you have ever watched Maury? Yeah, me too. Would there be as much suspense if Maury changed how he announced the results of all those paternity tests? Jack, you don't have to worry because you are not the father. That's the new information. That's the information we've been waiting the last 40 minutes and endless commercials to get. Maury would not say, I have the results in the envelope. Because you are not the father, Jack, you don't have to support this child anymore. That wouldn't work. Plus, the audience would scream and yell. But <laughs> this uh, rather interesting example, I hope, serves to illustrate that if you have new, important information, put your because clause at the end of the sentence. Here are a couple of poetry passages that start with because. They are complete sentences complex sentences. Because I was happy upon the heath and smiled among the winter snow, they clothed me in the clothes of death and taught me to sing the notes of woe. William Blake. Emily Dickinson, who is similarly mystic in a lot of her work, because I could not stop for death, comma, he kindly stopped for me. Would this work he kindly stopped for me because I could not stop for death. No, <laughs> we've already got some sort of shocking information. Because I could not stop for death. Oh, she's busy. She's not ready to die. He kindly stopped for me. Oh, whoa. Okay, that wasn't as expected. Did you expect the main clause in Blake's opening stanza? Because I was happy and smiled. They gave me clothes of death and notes of woe. Probably not. It can be very effective to start a sentence with a because dependent clause. If you've got some great, powerful, oh no, didn't see that coming, information for your main clause. So what's an elliptical adverbial clause? The subject is implied rather than stated. Elliptical adverbials are not incorrect. They're not grammatically wrong. As our book says on page 163, these can produce tighter structures, and there is certainly no problem in interpreting the meaning. While preparing for the exam, we reviewed our notes. Do I really need to say, while we were preparing for the exam, we reviewed our notes? I could, but I don't have to, either for grammar or for meaning. Elliptical adverbial clauses often start with while or when and they remove the subject and sometimes part of the verb. This sentence could read, while we were preparing. But I've taken out the we and the were and just said, while preparing. Go ahead and look at page 164, the topic that says for group discussion. Although elliptical adverbial clauses are thumbs up, go ahead, use them, you can use them incorrectly. Joe likes Tracy better than Pat. What does this sentence mean? Does it mean that Joe likes Tracy better than he likes Pat? Or does Joe like Tracy more than Pat does? Sometimes when you get a little elliptical, you can get a little confusing as well. If there's more than one possible meaning, you're better off including the subject and verb just so you're clear. Rhetorical grammar is about getting your message across. Let's look at another example. How can both of these sentences be grammatical? My little sister likes our cat better than me. My little sister likes our cat better than I. These are both grammatical because they have two different meanings. What does the first one mean? If my little sister were faced with it's me or the cat, she would choose the cat. She likes the cat more than she likes me. The second one, we have an implied verb left out. My little sister likes our cat better than I do. 
Now instead of my little sister choosing between me and the cat, my little sister and I are choosing the cat. Does this make sense? My little sister likes our cat more than she likes me. My little sister likes our cat more than I do. Because I've gotten elliptical with my adverbials, I can have this both ways. Finally, here's the point where we're going to start class discussion next time we meet. Exercise 26, which starts on the bottom of page 164. Would you use this in the classroom? What grade levels? How would it help students learn? If you are not a future teacher, look at it for yourself. Would you want to do this activity? Would it help you learn something about grammar, or can you think of a better way to master these skills and content? Don't forget about your quiz, and I'll see you soon.